Hey guys, David here. Welcome to Digital Outlook. I believe the video that I have for you today could change your life forever. So why don't we get to it? Okay guys, so just like my uh, video thumbnail said, this video is about preparing you for life-changing wealth. And before we get into all the details, I want to talk a little bit about what's motivated me to start this channel. So I wanted to start this channel probably about a year or so ago, just a little over a year ago. But, you know, I had uh, kept putting it off. And then um, on top of that, you know, my family had a big move and things were going on and it, I just never really got to it. But what's motivated me now to start this channel is because I see a lot of fear, a lot of uncertainty, and a lot of doubt in what's going on in the world, and specifically, of course, in financial markets. And at the same time, I'm seeing a lot of people being taken advantage of and being lied to and being deceived, rug pulled, whatever you want to call it. And it has just made me sick. And the sad part about all of that is it's coming from people that you normally would trust. In fact, people that we have been trained to trust um, throughout our life. And in the course of this video, I'm going to actually show you specifically what I'm talking about. Because big changes are coming to the world. And they're not telling you how fundamentally these changes are going to impact all of our lives and the opportunity that lies before us right now where we can profit from these changes. So that's what's really motivated me uh, to start this channel is to just educate people, make them aware, and to the best of my ability, help them to avoid pitfalls that I experienced and, and really succeed in this area without having to make those same mistakes. The goal of this channel is I'm gonna try and put out one video a day and uh, hopefully I'll get some better equipment. I know my sound isn't absolutely perfect, but it's the best of what I got right now. So in the videos that I am going to be putting out, I'm going to make some deep dives into various ecosystems to actually explain them in detail and to go over what the, the fundamental analysis of these ecosystems are, what their real world utility is and how it will impact our all of our futures and how we can profit from them. Now, I have to throw this caveat out there. Look, I'm not a financial advisor, and anything I'm telling you is for information purposes only. But as we all know, information is power. It gives us the ability to make decisions that we feel are good for us. So when you've reviewed the information that I'm going to give you, you can make your own decisions about what you want to do with it. But I will tell you about my story in future videos and how this information impacted my life. So without further ado, here we go. So guys, here we are on this page where it talks about comparing money and markets for the world. And what I really want to draw out here is where's all the money supply? Like, and this is from a year, few years back, like this is 2020. So now, of course, we're in 2022. See 2020 right there. So now we're in 2022. And, you know, I, I suspect that some of these numbers are probably a lot higher than what they are in here. But what I want to show you is something really interesting about the world money supply. So each one of these little squares is worth $100 billion. Now, just imagine $100 billion. That's a phenomenal amount of money. So these are, this is the silver market. This is uh, the cryptocurrency market. Now it says other 5,000, I guess there's about 19,000 different projects out there right now, but you see Bitcoin and different ones, Bitcoin being the granddaddy of them all. This is military spending, you know, 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 billion, you know, it goes on and on and it's over a trillion dollars there. Here's in uh, 2020 what the U.S. federal budget deficit was. So you got 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, 800, I mean into the trillions you can see. Now here is a um, basket of currencies and this is all coins and banknotes and how they all add up in there. Here's the Fed's balance sheet. And back then it said add it since January 1st of 2020. And you can see like, wow. I mean, look at the balance sheet from 2008 financial crisis until now. Phenomenal. This is the world's billionaires. Here's gold. 
Here's the wealth of the Fortune 500, and of course you got Alphabet, Google there, Amazon, Apple, uh, Microsoft, Facebook, stock markets, New York Stock Exchange, here's the NASDAQ, and here's all the other world exchanges. This is money supply, just all the broad money supply around the world. And look at this, global debt. Now this is household debt, that's you, me, and whatever. Here's the government debt, government and household debt, uh, pretty close. Look at the uh, non-financial corporate debt and the financial sector itself. Now here's global real estate. This is a value of all real estate around the world. This up here is all residential. Here we have commercial and agricultural. Now here's global wealth, right? And this is according to Credit Suisse, all global wealth tallies about $360 trillion. That's North America. Here's Europe. Um, Asia Pacific, China, Latin America, Africa, whatever. Now, this is a real, this is the derivative market. If you ever seen the big short, you got an idea of what derivatives are. And it's it it says the gross market value is eleven point six trillion. And the notional value is five hundred and fifty-eight point five trillion. Back in twenty twenty, they actually believe it's over one quadrillion. One quadrillion. And the notional value, one quadrillion. So, I mean, that is the world money supply, kind of in a nutshell. It's a really great visual display of what it is. But what I want to point out to you is way back up here, this. Because what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about blockchain technology and how it is absolutely fundamentally being incorporated into all of our infrastructure and specifically our financial sector and monetary supply. And I'm going to actually show you specifically how it's happening. But needless to say, what I want to point out is look at how tiny this is relative to all of these other asset classes and, and balance sheets. Now, can you imagine what would happen if, let's say, just a few of these, let's say, you know, two or three of these uh, Euro ones popped up in there or a few of these United States ones under global bank notes. So what about what about uh, Fortune 500 companies, which I'm going to show you are investing heavily into this blockchain space right now, and these governments, unbelievable, and then the stock market. I'm going to actually show you in future videos how the entire stock market is going to be tokenized. That is the goal. That is the plan. And there is all kinds of information out there that supports this. And just imagine this entire thing is going to be managed through blockchain technology at some point. Ask yourself this question. How is that going to impact the value of this here if just a few of those come over? It's going to be monumental. It's going to be life-changing. We are talking about a generational change in the way finance and the monetary system operates. Now, I just want you to think about that for a moment. We're talking about a change that has not happened in at least 100 years. Imagine the impact that's going to have on the way we live our lives, the way we pay for things, the way we we do business, the way we get paid, on and on and on. Now think about the opportunities that may exist for us to profit from that change right now. Okay, guys, so one of the first questions that we have to address is, what is blockchain? Well, here's a basic, straightforward definition of what blockchain is. Blockchain's a system of recording information in a way that makes it difficult or impossible to change, hack, or cheat the system. A blockchain is essentially a digital ledger of transactions that is duplicated and distributed across the entire network of computer systems on the blockchain. Each block in the chain contains a number of transactions, and every time a new transaction occurs on the blockchain, a record of that transaction is added to every participant's ledger. The decentralized database managed by multiple participants is known as distributed ledger technology. Blockchain is a type of distributed ledger technology in which transactions are recorded with an immutable cryptographic signature called a hash. So here's 
just a basic diagram of what it is, properties of distributed ledger technology. It's programmable. Um, you've got all kinds of things like smart contracts. Um, it's secure. In, all records are individually encrypted. It's anonymous. The identity of participants is either anonymous or pseudonymous. It's unanimous. All network participants agree to the validity of each of, each of the records. It's time-stamped, so that can never be changed. Time-stamped is recorded on a block. It's immutable. Any validated records are irreversible and can't be changed. That's fundamental. And distribute it. All network participants have a copy of the ledger for complete transparency. It says here that if one block and one chain was changed, it would be immediately apparent that it had been tampered with. So if hackers wanted to corrupt a blockchain system, they would have to change every block in the chain across all the distributed versions of the chain. So basically, it's nigh on impossible. So why is there so much hype around this blockchain technology? Well, here it's stating there have been many attempts to create digital money in the past, but they have always failed. The prevailing issue is trust. And that's why you're going to hear people say, if you've ever heard this before, that blockchain's a trustless system, meaning you don't trust one another, you trust the technology. If someone creates a new currency called the X dollar, how can we trust that they won't give themselves a million X dollars or steal your X dollars for themselves? Uh, sound familiar? Kind of like the Federal Reserve and all these guys that are just creating money out of thin air from their central banks. They can do it for them, but not for us, of course. Bitcoin was designed to solve this problem by using a, suspe a specific type of database called a blockchain. Most normal databases, such as an SQL database, have someone in charge who can change the entries, e.g. giving themselves a million dollars. Blockchain is different because nobody is in charge. It's run by the people who use it. What's more, Bitcoins can't be faked, hacked, or double spent. So people that own this money can trust that it has some value. The point that I'm making here about blockchain is it is a very programmable and secure form of distributing not just finance, but information. So all kinds of information, healthcare information, you know, title information, information about drivers. I mean, it is all there. And that is where the future is going. But the real driver is going to be these financial markets. Why? Because we are coming to the end of the current financial system. And a new system is being developed right now. And I'm about to show you what it is. And every central bank in the world right now is in the process of developing what's called a central bank digital currency. And they're basing it off of blockchain technology. Let me show you. Okay, guys. So what I have here is the Federal Reserve's website on central bank digital currencies. And listen to what they say a central bank digital currency is. A CBDC is a digital form of central bank money that is widely available to the general public. Central bank refers to money that is a liability of the central bank. In the United States, there, is, there are currently two types of central bank money, physical currency issued by the Federal Reserve and digital balances held by commercial banks at the Federal Reserves. While Americans have long held money predominantly in digital form, for example, in bank accounts, payment apps, and through online transactions, a CBDC would differ from existing digital money available Available to the general public because a CBDC would be a liability of the Federal Reserve and not a commercial bank. And they literally have a link here. It says learn about more about the Federal Reserve's work on a CBDC. So that's the U.S. Federal Reserve. So now let's look at the International Monetary Fund. What do they have to say about it? Well, look at this. We know that the move towards CBDCs is gaining momentum driven by the ingenuity of central banks. All told, around 100 countries are exploring CBDCs at one level or another, some researching, some testing, and a few already distributing CBDCs to the public. Look at this. In China, the digital 
Renembi, called ECNY, continues to progress with more than a hundred million individual users and billions of yuan in transactions. And just last month, the Federal Reserve of the United States issued a report that noted that a CBDC could fundamentally change the structure of the U.S. financial systems. As you might expect, the International Monetary Fund is deeply involved in this issue, including through providing technical assistance to many members. What are the members of the IMF? Countries, central banks. An important role for the fund is to promote exchange of experience and support the interoperability of CBDCs. All right, let's check somewhere else. This is the Bank of International Settlements. Listen, look at their whole page on Central Bank Digital uh, Currency. Central Bank Digital Currencies offer in digital form the unique advantages of central bank money. Settlement, finality, liquidity, and integrity. They are an advanced representation of money for the digital economy. That's all right in there. All right, what next? Ah, the World Economic Forum. When it comes to CBDCs, we need public and private cooperation. So what do they mean, public and private? They're talking about government and private corps. Listen to this. Central bank digital currencies are becoming more and more interesting for governments as effective ways of managing the digital economy. Most central banks have not begun implementation of the currency as, a, as concerns remain. An important success factor for the future of CBDC regime is cooperation between the public and private sector. Participation of the private sector in developing, testing, and deploying a CBDC will have several benefits and will become more important as CBDCs could play a huge role in the future of financial systems. So guys, they are going forward with their agenda and they have one right up there, global agenda. You can read it. And guys, they're going to be incorporating private organizations in the development of these CBDCs and their new payment system. And it's going to be happening a lot faster than many of us think. And in fact, I'm going to show you a timeline that they have already published to demonstrate how soon this is going to happen and who they're going to be working with to get it all done. Okay, guys, we're coming full circle with this now. I'm introducing you to ISO 222 and what this basically is. It says here that banks and financial institutions globally are entering a new era, just like we discussed, as they prepare to transition their payment systems from using SWIFT messages, which has been around since the 1970s, to the new highly structured data-rich ISO 222 financial messaging standard. By 2025, it will be the universal standard for high or large value payment systems of all reserve currencies. That's all the CBDCs worldwide and will support 80% of transaction volumes and 87% of transaction value globally. In Europe, SWIFT and the European Central Bank have announced ISO 222 go live dates as of November 22nd, or sorry, November 2022, so this year, for the standard. So here's their outline. This is their roadmap right here. You can see that here. So what's really happening here, guys, is they are now implementing this change for their payment systems. They're going to be utilizing the CBDCs. They're going to be um, having bridge assets that are blockchain-based, that are with private companies, which is what we read from the World Economic Forum, integrating with them. And I'm going to show you who those companies are to actually do all these transactions. So let's take a look over here to show you how fast this is really going to happen. It says the American Bankers Association is supporting the Federal Reserve, that's the U.S. Fed Central Bank, plan to migrate the Fedwire Fund services to the ISO 222 messaging standard in a single day. They are literally going to do it in one day and they're going to flip that switch. But says it has serious concerns about a lack of detail on the testing strategy and requirements for the move. But that's exactly what they're going to do. They do have a timeline and that timeline is very 
very quick. So here we talk about cryptocurrencies compliant with the ISO 222 update. It says here the ISO 222 has remained one of the major topics of dialogue for investors in recent years, even among crypto enthusiasts. Today, a key update to this standard invites investors to consider a list of potential ISO 222 crypto tokens that could benefit from its implementation. In a recent statement, the Federal Reserve Board noted that the new messaging format will be adopted for the Fedwire Fund services. Essentially, ISO 222 is rapidly growing global language for messaging and payments made across borders. This is a development that surpasses the existing lower and more expensive payment infrastructure. Practically, the FRB seeks to optimize and simplify the payment infrastructure. The gray side to this is that the recent development may not argue well with high-ranking cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin. Experts suggest that the ISO 222 may inhibit the potential of various large crypto networks by impeding their progress toward their goal of being a universal means of sending and receiving money abroad. This is because the standard eliminates many of the advantages that many cryptocurrencies can give in a centralized setting. However, some cryptocurrencies have begun to gear up to meet that requirement, and we have made a list of those cryptocurrencies. So you can see them down here. You have Algorand, IOTA, Ripple, Stellar Lumens, XDC. There's also information that Cardano and Hedera Hashgraph are also ISO 222 compliant. So guys, what you're seeing here is actually the global agenda that the World Economic Forum talked about, and that is the implementation of blockchain technology in central bank digital currencies working hand in glove with both private sector and the government. This is a monumental shift in the way value is transferred around the globe. This is going to be the internet of value. What you're seeing here are the very beginnings of our new global financial system. With this information, we have the opportunity to position ourselves to make life-changing wealth. Okay, guys, let's just get down to some brass tacks here. What I'm on this page right here, I'm on Binance. Now, Binance is the world's largest digital asset exchange. Now, these exchanges exist in almost every country, Certainly in every continent, Canada, America, we got Europe, it's in Africa, Asia, you know, South America, all that kind of stuff. And this is where these digital assets are traded on a daily basis. Now, these exchanges operate 24-7, unlike the stock exchanges that, you know, uh, 9 to 5 and then they close on the weekends. These don't. They are 365 24 7 so what i have over here i want to show you is remember all those iso 222 compliant digital assets that are going to be used in the implementation of the new messaging system that banks are going to use worldwide in the transfer of all these cbcs and all that stuff well i want you to see that they're all listed here here's cardano here's stellar xlm here's algorand here's iota Here's Hedera Hashgraph. Here's XRP. What I want you to notice here is look at the value of these assets right now. 53 cents for ADA. 13 cents for XLM. 40 cents for Algorand. 34 cents for IOTA. Hedera Hashgraph. Less than 10 cents. XRP. 40 cents. Now I want to ask you to think about something. Imagine you're in the early days of the internet. The early days of the development of the iPhone. Now, it happened pretty seamlessly. All of us as retail merchants, and we bought these phones and this and that, and, in, and just in such a short time, we see all this development. Well, all that development underneath had supporting technology. And if you were investing back then in Apple, in Amazon, when it was just dollars or pennies, and now are thousands of dollars, just that long-term view of where it went, now, nothing I'm giving you right now is financial advice. I'm giving you information that you can use to make your own decisions about what you can do. But what I'm, what I'm talking about here is, in my opinion, 
what I see is this huge, massive potential opportunity. Because right now, guys, we are in the infancy of this space in the monetary system and the changes that are are absolutely coming and we can position ourselves to benefit from these changes that we can create life-changing wealth over time. Now, one of the things, the challenges that we are going to face in this space is the people that normally we should trust. The ones that should be saying, hey, yeah, this is, you know, the right thing to do. This is, uh, you know, a great opportunity for you. They're the ones that are actually talking about holding us back. Now, I'm going to show you a few little slides here going forward and about how the market actually works, how they manipulate us with either a fear of missing out or a fear of getting in with fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And there's a few things that I want to point out. Now, one of them here is called the Wall Street Cheat Sheet. And I want you to pay close attention to the title. It's called the Wall Street Cheat Sheet. It's not the Main Street Cheat Sheet. It's the Wall Street Cheat Sheet. Because this is a psychology of market cycles. They know that people invest and the psychology is emotion. And so what do they do? They use these kind of ideas as they go up and they manipulate us all the way up and they manipulate us all the way down. So let me show you. So here you are at the beginning of a market cycle and, you know, um, you're over here in depression and you get into this disbelief phase. Yeah, that's, you know, possible, maybe not. And all the news items out there are going to be, yeah, guys, you don't want to touch this. You don't want to get into it. Blah, 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 blah. And all the while, these big bankers are stacking their bags. And then, you know, they, the price moves up a bit and people get this kind of hopeful thing and moves up a little more in their rally. Then they get belief. Now you're going to start seeing all these articles. Hey, guys, this is a perfect investment for you. You need to get into it. Da, 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 da. And absolute euphoria. That's when you get like uh, celebrities and everybody coming out at that time. And everyone's just pumping it, pumping it, pumping it. And they're, what they're trying to do is get you to have this fear of missing out and to buy in way up here when reality is you should be buying way down here where they're buying. So let me show you something else. This here is called the Crypto Fear and Greed Index. This is where people are in extreme fear. Now, they're in extreme fear for a few reasons. Some people bought way up at the top when they were way up here being FOMO'd in. And they've now lost. Now they're back down here. They're back down like, who's short at the market? Why did the government allow this to happen? And they're angry. They're depressed. You know, my retirement money is lost and they just can't see that it's going to come back up. And so they're in big time fear. But another reason why they're in big time fear is because they're being manipulated by the very people they should be trusting to actually help them to know how to navigate this market. And that's their investment advisors. That's their big banks. That's JP. Morgan and the like. And I'm going to show you some things that are actually pretty uh, shocking when you, when you get right down to it of how they manipulate this market. So let's take a look over here. So over here, I got a little video. We're going to play a little bit of it. And the title is The Fortune 100 Lying Liars and the Lies They Tell About Crypto. The Fortune 100 wants to get into crypto as cheap an entry as possible, and they're willing to lie their way to get that goal. So just take a listen to this, and uh, we'll get back to it in a couple minutes. On September 12th, Jamie Dimon says Bitcoin is a fraud. He says he'll fire any one of his traders buying Bitcoin. Bitcoin drops 24%. When Jamie Dimon speaks, people listen. People listen. So that weekend, we found out that the largest buyer of a, of a Bitcoin fund that's in Europe that buys physical Bitcoin, right? The largest buyer was Morgan Stanley and JP Morgan. And that's not illegal. He says it's a fraud. It says he'll fire anyone that buys it. Yes. And at the same time, his company is buying his it. His company is buying it. So, ir it's just, I mean, so unethical. Right. Okay, George Soros. George Soros, in Eat January 24th, <laughs> price was already down, calls Bitcoin a bubble, 
says Bitcoin is the worst, you know, the worst investment in the world. Don't buy Bitcoin. Don't buy Bitcoin. Basically throws uh, gasoline on the fire yeah. at this point. And then what do we find out? So he says bubble here. It drops 44%. Right. And then here in April, two months later, guess what we find out? Yeah. His $26 billion family office has approval to buy cryptocurrency. Right. And you only, we only knew about it publicly right. here. Here. And yes. this is the kind of thing that George, George Soros is famous for this, talking yeah. the sterling down. Yeah. And what did he do? He stole the pensions of all the little people. Yeah, made a billion. Yeah. Okay. So then here now, Goldman Sachs, this again, February 7th, most cryptocurrencies will crash to zero. Now, I remember when they said this in February, and I had, through my network, I knew that Goldman Sachs was setting up a crypto trading desk. Absolutely knew they were setting up a crypto trading desk. And I then, remember you telling me that. Right. And then, uh, of course, they were denying it. No, yeah, we're not. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. we're not. No, we're not. Yeah. Price falls down 27%, and then what do we find out? We find out here, uh, they say BTC zero, and then we find out just before May, new trading desk. Not only that, they put $400 million to buy a cryptocurrency trading platform. Okay, so February 7th, L, it's all going to zero. May, oh, we're gonna, we just spent $400 million just on a, on a flyer. And they're not the only ones? No, no. Um, so... It, you have a lot of institutions that are coming. You had Christine Lagarde from the IMF yeah. come out. And this was what's funny about this, Glenn, is it was all around the same time. It yeah. was almost like the, I can't prove collusion, but, you know, it walks like a duck. It quacks like a duck. And, and you know what? It's probably a duck. The people, they all hang out together. They all think alike. It doesn't right. have to be calling each other. Yeah. They just, they know this game. Yes. So IMF, Christine Lagarde says in the first part of the year, says all central banks should band together against right. cryptocurrency. Right. Have you ever heard her say all, all banks should band together against illegal arms? No. Or illegal drugs? No. Or human trafficking? No. No. But this nascent asset class, we must all join arms and against. This, what this did was play into people's heads that these guys are never going to let Bitcoin survive. survive. Right. And so people thought, they this is over. Selling. Yeah. So let me show you, I'm, can we show a chart of the five crashes? This is from, I think... Last year, right? Last year. Yeah. Okay. So do, do we have yeah. that chart of the, the five crashes of, of Bitcoin? Right. It was 30%. Right. It was, I think four of them were 30% and right. one was 40%. And, uh, and this is, here it is. Um, sh sh explain this chart. Those right. are Amazon crashes. Here okay, so these are Amazon. Do you have, have Bitcoin? Have, yeah, we need the Bitcoin chart. We are All right, so they'll, good. They'll come they'll up later. Okay. Yeah. So what I want to talk about now is one of the key lessons I learned from being involved in the market so long is rather than uh, listening to what people are saying, look at what they are doing. Correct. So. So guys, you're kind of getting the point of what I mentioned at the beginning of this. What upsets me so much is that people that we should trust, the IMF, people we should trust, JP Morgan, our investment advisors, they're all telling us, oh, no, 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 be so scared. Don't do it. Don't do it. Meanwhile, they're loading up their bags. They're knowing of the future that they plan and their global agenda and how they're going to benefit from it and keeping us out in the cold. So just to reiterate that, here is the actual uh, article where JP Morgan Chase, CEO, I'd fire traders who bet on the fraud Bitcoin. And this was Jamie Dimon. And he basically said, JP Morgan Chase, CEO, Jamie Dimon said Tuesday he would fire any employee trading Bitcoin for being stupid. Well, lo and behold, look at this. JP Morgan sees significant upside to Bitcoin, replaces real estate with crypto as a preferred alternative asset. And it really doesn't stop there, guys. So I want to show you something over here. This is absolutely, this is today. Why Bank of America, May 28, 2022, won't be rushing into crypto anytime soon. So out of that Davos, Switzerland, that's the World Economic Forum, this is their global agenda. The crypto faithful shouldn't expect Bank of America to make a major push into the sector anytime soon. No reply, Bank of America CEO Brian T. Mohanian. When Yahoo Finance Live asked him at the World Economic Forum whether he felt like the 
company was missing out on the next big thing not aggressively moving into crypto. Moyhan, who is driven by major digital banking as a Bank of Amer- America CEO for last year, explained the bank is heavily regulated and prevents an all-in maneuver to crypto. Oh, really? Now that is May 28, 2022. I want to show you something over here. Ripple, remember? One of our ISO 222 compliant um, uh, digital assets that are working with the banks. Ripple announces partnership with Bank of America. Fintech giant XRP confirmed its claim, or I should say Ripple, who uh, has an XRP ledger, confirmed its claim to partner with Bank of America with an update on its website. Bank of America, one of the largest banks in the USA, now uses RippleNet technology, which includes XRP like hundreds of other financial institutions. Want a little more? Look at this. Ripple named Bank of America as key member of its global payments network. So the point I'm making here, guys, is use your own due diligence. Do your own research. Don't Listen to all the fear, uncertainty, and doubt just because other people have given up on their dreams. Don't let them talk you out of yours. This is a life-changing opportunity, in my opinion, going forward, down the road. Imagine if when this was going on back in 2017 and Bitcoin was only $400 in 2017. Even at today's prices, it's $30,000. So, and it went up to about what, $69,000. And if you had have invested back then in some of these digital assets, I'll give you an example. So that XRP, it was trading at 0. 0.006 of one cent back in 2017. In 20, by the beginning of 2018, it went up to $3.84. A $6,000 investment would have netted you $3.8 million. Now, this is, like I said, not financial advice. Nothing is guaranteed in life. But if you never take a risk, you're never going to experience these benefits. If we're all going to be held back by our fear, And if we're going to listen to the narrative of people that have their own agenda, and they do, and it's not for you and I, it's for them to become wealthier and more in control. And if we're going to listen to that narrative and make all our decisions based on that information, then we probably won't experience these opportunities. That's my opinion. And that's why I'm doing this video and that's why I'm starting this channel is to give people information that they can use to their advantage if they want to or not. So guys, this is the video that I have for you today. And I just want to reiterate that this is my personal opinion. It's not financial advice. But if you got value out of this video, hit the like and subscribe. And in the meantime and in between time, stay safe and be blessed. And I'll catch you in the next one.